picking up with Act 3, um, and before we start, if you want any of your papers back, um, probably the best time to get those would be next semester, last week of January, first week of February, something like that. Um, I'm probably not going to be teaching next semester because I'm probably having knee replacement surgery middle of January. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm sure I won't be on campus the, week, the first week of class. Uh, I'll probably try to come back, come by and drop them off either that last week of January, first week of February. And when I do, they'll be outside my office door in a little like cardboard magazine holder and there'll be a sticky note with Shakespeare written on it with an arrow pointing down and your papers um, will be in a big envelope with your name on the outside. Um, I'll probably send an email as a reminder that'll just say, you know, take your paper and leave the envelope because I reuse, so there'll be a bunch of names crossed through because I reuse them that way. That way nobody can look at your paper and that kind of stuff. Um, so if you want them, that's real, where they'll be. I'll probably leave them out there until second week of February, something like that, and after that, uh, they get recycled, okay? meaning trashed. So. Um, and if you, uh, I think I said this in the exam handout, if you want to turn your final exam paper in early, uh, you may. If you don't want it back, you can email it to me. If you do want it back, I need a hard copy. Uh, you can put it in the box on my office door, pick all 352. Um, I'll be by on Monday around noon, probably to pick everything up that will be stuffed in that box. Um, okay, so we're picking up Act 3, Scene 1. We're going to skip most of Act um, 2, Scene 2, because essentially, I mean, it's there for comedic relief, and it's, it's essentially there so that we can see Taliban swear, essentially swear fealty to uh, Trinculo and Stefano. Okay? More to Trinculo than Stefano. So, <coughs> Act 3, Scene 1. <clears throat> we see Ferdinand come in carrying a log. And he's carrying a log, he's moving it from one pile to another. This is the labor that uh, Prospero ha has assigned to him. And he's doing this for one purpose. What's he trying to prove on Ferdinand's part? What's Prospero trying to prove on Ferdinand's part? He's testing his love for his daughter. If he'll do this test, then he must really love her. If he gives up, if he says, no, I'm not going to do this, then it shows he's not worthy of her. And we hear Ferdinand say, there be some sports are painful, and their labor, delight in them, sets off. Some sports here doesn't mean like we mean sports. He means activities. There are some things that are hard and painful to do, but there is some delight that we get in them that what sets off the pain. It, it kind of dulls the pain. Um, runners will say that. They used to run marathons. You don't run a marathon without training for it, without doing long runs. Long runs for a marathon, marathon's 26.2 miles. A long run is anything over 18 miles. Well, you don't just wake up one morning and decide, I'm going to go do a long run without having built up to those long runs. Okay? It doesn't mean you end that long run and you just feel like you're on cloud nine and, and uh, there are no problems. No, usually you're sore. Same thing with a marathon. Usually after a marathon, most people can't walk very well. I mean, they look like they're, okay. But there's a delight, masochistic one, that comes from that, okay. Some kinds of baseness are nobly undergone. Baseness, low common activity, mundane activity, are done what? They're nobly performed. Think of Theseus' comment about the players who do Pyramus and Thisbe for him. He attributes that nobility to them, even though he says, I really can't do this. 
I know they're going to butcher it. Okay? And most poor matters point to rich ends. Huh. He's implying there that there's something noble about work that doesn't have to do with the work itself. That is that the work does something on the individual. The work itself becomes ennobling to the individual who undertakes it. This, my mean task, carrying logs from one place to another, would be as heavy to me as odious, but the mistress which I serve quickens what's dead and makes my labors pleasures. He says he's doing it for whom? Miranda. He's not literally doing it for Miranda. He's literally doing it for Prospero. Ten times more gentle than her father's crabbed. He's composed of harshness. I must remove some thousands of these logs and pile them up upon a sore injunction. My sweet mistress weeps when she sees me work and says such baseness had never like executor. Seeing her cry over my doing this work, he goes, oh, that makes it easy for I forget, but these sweet thoughts do even refresh my labors most busy when I do it. And Miranda comes in, and Prospero, at a distance, unseen. So probably, if you're thinking of the stage, you know, he's out here, here's a pile of sticks. He goes and picks them up, and he moves them, and he puts them over here. Miranda comes in from a door back here, comes out to him. Prospero comes in and stands over here. And just observes. Don't work so hard. I would the lightning had burnt up those logs that you were enjoying to pile, but set, set it down and rest. He said, no, no, no. The sun will set before I shall discharge what I must strive to do. I, I've only got a certain amount of sunlight left. Sit down. I'll carry your logs. I'll do your job for you. I had rather crack my sinews and break my back than you should such dishonor undergo while I sit lazy by. Why? Because he's a typical, typical Elizabethan patriarchal male. He's putting her up on her pedestal. No, no, no. This is beneath you. But she's also saying it's beneath you too. This is why we have Taliban's. This is a job for slaves or servants. It would become me as well as it does you, she says, and I should do it with much more ease. Why? For my good will is to it. Her good desire is to it. Why? She wants to ease his suffering. Notice, he's doing it, kind of, to ease her suffering. So they're both trying to ease each other's suffering. Who are they both thinking of? Each other. Neither one is thinking about himself or herself. Prosper, poor worm, thou art infected. He's talking about his daughter there. She's infected. With what? Love. Miranda says, you look tired. You look weary. He says, no, no, no. Tis fresh morning with me with you are by at night. Nope. It's always like dawn. When you're nearby. And he mentions Tiasca. What is your name? Why? Chiefly that I might set it in my prayers. Now, we don't know if they are going, Oh dear Jesus, please let me, what's her name? Please let me marry. Or, oh dear Jesus, forgive her all her sins. It could be one of those two. That is, the prayer could be entirely selfish. I want her. Or it could be entirely altruistic. Miranda. Oh, my father. <gasps> Oops. I should have put this one. Admired. Notice the pun. Play on words. Admired Miranda. Indeed, the top of admiration full, worth what's dearest to the world. For many a lady I have eyed with best regard. That is, with best regard 
not thinking of myself, thinking of my desires. I've I full many a lady with pure thoughts. Okay. And many a time the harmony of their tongues hath into bondage brought my too diligent ear. In other words, they sing good songs. They have a good voice, and I've 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 become enslaved. For several virtues have I liked several women. Now, that can be read two radically different ways. It can be read, let's say, woman, A, women, A, B, C, D, E, N, F. In woman A, I like virtue one. In woman two, I like virtue two. But woman B, virtue two, three, four, five, six. Or it could be, Woman A had virtues 1 and 6, and virtue woman B had virtues 2 and 4, woman C had virtue 3, and woman D had also virtue 1. And in other words, you can go through a wild permutation. But notice what he's suggesting. For several virtues have I liked several women, never any with so full soul, but some defect in her, did quarrel with the noblest grace she owed, and put it to the foil. That is, each one of them, while they have these several virtues, maybe she's got all seven. Right? Maybe each of them have all seven. But each of them also had a defect. Well, what would a defect be in terms of this language? A vice. You could say her virtue is love. What would be a vice that would detract from love? Anger. Her virtue is, let's say, chastity. A vice? So he says, I've loved all these other women, but each one of them, they had a flaw. But you, oh, perfect and peerless, peerless, without compare, without peer, you are created of every creature's best. I'm going to take the best of A, the best of B, the best of C, the best of D, the best of E, the best of F, And you combine all those, and you end up with your A. Now, again, that can be read two different ways, at least. One of those, supremely possible. Miranda is one of them. She's the best. She's the greatest. The other is, all other reading kind of suggests that you could say that essentially on I loved Katie, Julie, Beth, Elizabeth, Darla, and Jean. And you're kind of like all of them are kind of fun. I don't know about you, but if I were a woman and a guy came to me and said that, I'd probably slap him. At the least. Shakespeare does this in his sonnets, by the way, also. Same kind of thing. And he's not the only one. A lot of other poets at the same period, they do this all over the place. Okay? You know, it's um, not Waylon Jennings, not Kenny Rogers, Ponytail, Pot, who's else? Willie Nelson, thank you. Uh, to all the women I've loved before, kind of a thing. Okay? And she says, I do not know one of my sex. So he's talking about all these women. She goes, I've never met another woman. I don't know what other women are like. No woman's face remembers, save from my glass mine own, nor have I seen more that I may call men than you, good friend, and my dear father. What's she getting at? I have no judge of what women are like or men are like. She's kind of like an Ophelia. 
teach me. I, I don't know anything. Nor have I seen, uh, excuse me, how features are abroad I am skillless of. But by my modesty, the jewel in my dower, I would not wish any companion in the world but you. What's the euphemism? The jewel in my dower. I'm not going to give my virginity up to anyone but you. Notice what she just said, though. The only two men I know, Dad, you, and you. I've never seen anything like that. Theoretically, theoretically, what could Ferdinand look like? Awful, plain, ordinary. He could be the third Hemsworth brother. You know, you have Chris and Liam. And then you have the guy who's the accountant. He's like short and pudgy. He doesn't look like either of the other two Hemsworth brothers. Right? But she says, you're the one. I would not wish any companion in the world but you. Well, that's different than sex, right? The first one has to do with sex. The second one has to do with friendship. Nor can imagination form a shape beside yourself to like of. On the basis of knowing what her father looks like and knowing what Ferdinand looks like, she has a pretty good idea what men look like. You don't need really much more than that. But she says, I can't conceive of a higher offer than you. I think it was St. Anselm who said, God is that beyond which we cannot conceive. She's kind of saying, you're pretty close to God in my imagination. Not God, the ruler of the universe, all that kind of stuff. You are, my imagination is, you're the ideal. And he kind of said the same thing about her when she wasn't there. Talk about infected. <laughs> they both got a bad for each other, right? Uh, but I prattle something too wildly in my father's precepts I there and do forget. Are her father's precepts about not being a prattling woman? I don't think so. I thought, what are her father's precepts about? Don't talk with the man. Why? Because he knows what will happen. Why does he give the precept then? Tell somebody, don't do this. Often. Well, they want to do it. They want to find out what's going to happen if I do that. Because what is part of his plan? And she and Ferdinand will marry. Right? Well, the family protects you again. So, Ferdinand says, well, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a prince. Okay, so that's, that's not bad, right? Uh, actually, I think I'm a king, and he thinks his father's dead. It would not so. I would no more endure this wooden slavery than to suffer the flesh, by f flesh fly blow my mouth. That is, I wouldn't. I, I, I would desire not to endure this, but hear my soul speak. The very instant that I saw you did my heart fly to your service. Right? There's a lot of talk in Renaissance poets about one falling in love with another and at that moment losing one's heart. That is, that the heart then becomes the property of the other. It, it almost resides in the other. And therefore, what can the other, the beloved, do to the individual who's fallen in love? Anything slash everything. Okay. There resides there in you to make me slave to it. And for your sake am I this patient dog in the hand. He started his little speech with saying what? I'm a prince. Actually, I think I'm a king. But because I saw you and my heart flew to your service, 
Therefore, now I am a patient, suffering, enduring log man. Kings don't carry their own logs. He's talking about how he's lost his place or how he is willing to throw off his crown and become something low and mean for her. Do you love me? Oh, heaven, oh, earth. Why heaven and earth? He joins the two. Divine love, love of God, love of what Plato called the sum of bonum, the highest good, and love of flesh, right? Because humanity is what? C.S. Lewis said, people are humans are amphibians. How so? An amphibian lives where? Both on dry land and in the water. Humans, think of the great chain of being here. Humans are amphibians in that we're both physical things and spiritual things. We have a soul, if one accepts that the premise of the soul. Okay? Oh heaven, soul, O earth, body, bear witness to this sound. What's the sound? What he's about to say. And crown what I profess with kind event if I speak true. Crown it. Top it off. Celebrate it. Confirm it as being true. If hollowly, that is, if I don't speak truly, invert what best has boded me to mischief. Turn my fortunes upside down. He's saying, don't let me be at the top with my fortunes cap. Let me be down at the bottom. If I'm lying, let me suffer. I, beyond all limit of what else in the world, I, beyond everything, is what that means, do love, prize, honor you. Okay? Prize. Does that mean he's saying, I take you as my prize? You're my spoils of war? I won you? No, that's not what he means. Prize means give value to her. He values her more than anything. Right? Honor, that's where he's saying, and I kind of I kind of bow down before you. I place you what? Before me. Before my needs. Before my desires. I don't remember if it was in this class or not. I don't remember what book it was. One of the books we read for, for my fantasy lit course was uh, Lloyd Alexander's Chronicles of Pridane series. And in the last book of the series, Terran, the hero, the protagonist of the series, makes a comment about what is a true hero. And he says, a hero is someone who thinks a little bit more about others than he does himself. A hero is someone who puts others before himself. Right? That's exactly what Ferdinand is doing here by saying, honor you. He's putting her before him, Miranda weeping, I am a fool to weep at what I am glad of. Oh, good. Why? Has she said I love you? No. Prospero, fair encounter. Fair, it means beautiful. Yes. What I wanted. Of two most rare affections. Heavens rain grace on that which breeds between them. What's that which breeds between them? He's not talking about children. Love. Heavens rain grace. So let grace fall from the heavens to do what? Well, what does rain do to dry parched ground? Waters it, nourishes it. Let Grace do what to this that is now between you? Water it. Make it fine. Make it firm. Make it get strong. Make it bind itself. You know what the word husband means, right? This, it's old English. 
modern English, house. Bond, literally it's house family. Notice wife merely comes from Old English with mind. Fe wife there means female. Female person. Female man. Man, traditionally understood, is gender neutral. It's humankind. This is female humankind. This is not male humankind. This is house bound. The old English mindset, it's the husband that's tied to the house. Not the wife. That's why. Because he's the protector, he's the provider, he's the defender, he's kind of the, you know, it's almost like you got a stake and you have a rope and the person can do what? This, as a poem by John Donne says, this is what keeps his circle just, his roaming just. Just, that is, and always been the answer, always gone to the Lord. All right? So, Ferdinand, why are you crying? At my unworthiness, that dare not offer what I desire to give, and much less take what I shall die to want. She says, I'm not worthy of you. But this is trifling, and all the more it seeks to hide itself, the bigger of all it shows, hence bashful cunning, and prompt me, plain and wholly innocent. Hence bashful cunning. Why does she mention cunning? Have any of you heard of a poem called To His Coy Mistress? It's a poem by Robert Herrick, take Andrew Marvel. It's a Carpe Diem poem. Andrew um, Robert Herrick wrote a poem called "To the Virgins to Make Much of Time." He wrote that a few years before Andrew Marvel. And in both of those, you get the word "coy" used. About whom is the adjective "coy" specific? About what kinds of people? Only women. It's never used for men. Never. So what's it mean? It means, partially at least, in the game of sex, or in the game of courting, or the dance of love, as medieval writers described it. It's the playing that the woman part does. That is, toying with the male lover. Toying how? Little winks, little nods, little smiles, little cues that say, come closer. And then little pushes, little frowns, little you know, furrowed brows that say, back off. And then winks, smiles, nods, come closer. Back off, come closer, back off. We have a phrase. Hard to get. Okay. Here she says, I'm going to do away with all that bashful cunning. Why bashful? Well, there's a little bit of, you know, shame involved, you know, having to. Maybe reveal a little too much. I don't mean sex, not skin, you know. But in the game, okay, letting it go maybe a little too far. But it's cunning, notice. She says, no, I'm done with that. I'm not going to play that game anymore. Now, prompt me plain and holy innocence. Innocence. That's what this is. Chastity does not mean no sex. Chastity means no sex with anybody else. <laughs> it means sex with only one person entirely. Okay? Hence, come to me, 
plain and holy innocence. I am your wife if you will marry me. How's that for no cunning, right? I mean, there's there's no mincing those words, right? Ferdinand can't go, hmm, I wonder what she means. It's pretty clear. Notice, Ferdinand is not the one to drop down on his knee, whip a ring out of his pocket and go, will you marry me? She says, I'm your wife if you will marry me. If not, I'll die your maid. Maid there means virgin. I will die virgin if I can't have you. Sound like anybody else? Hermia? Lysander? If I can't marry Lysander, I am not giving it up to Demetrius. I don't love him. I would rather die, Hermia says. To be your fellow, you may deny me, but I'll be your servant whether you will or no. That is, you can deny my being your fellow. What she mean by fellow? Where was the word used earlier? Companion was used. Line 53, 4. Line 55. She says, I would not wish any companion in the world but you. So, if you deny me to be your fellow, your companion, what's, what do both fellow and companion suggest? Partner, equal footing. We're gonna go, we're gonna go about this together. That is, what you suffer, I suffer. What you celebrate, I celebrate. What you enjoy, I enjoy. You can deny me that. And if you do, then I'll be your servant, whether you want me to or not. So, if you deny me to be Hermia to your Lysander, then I'll be what? I'll be Helena to your Demetrius. Before Demetrius' change, I'll be your Spaniel. You can whip me, beat me, slap me, if you like. He says, My mistress, dearest, and I thus humble ever. That is, I will humble myself before you. My husband then? I, with a heart as willing. As bondage, heir of freedom. No asking dad, no asking a church, no asking a priest, no asking a duke, etc., this is, this is your prototypical common law marriage. I love you. You love me. That's it. Done. Okay. And Prospero. So glad of this as they I cannot be, who are surprised with all. But my rejoicing at nothing can be more. I'll to my book, but for yet ere supper time must I perform much business appertaining. So glad of this as they, I cannot be. Well, why not? He doesn't have the companion. He doesn't have the fellow. He's, he's not just said, Jerry Maguire-ish, you complete me with you as they have. Why else? We see it in so many Shakespeare plays. We saw it in the beginning of this one. What is the father's role, partially at least, in Shakespeare's mind? Obstacle. She's there. He's here. He goes, boom, I'm going to put this table. So one of you has to walk around it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to put obstacles here. If you want her, what do you got to do, buddy? Crawl over broken glass naked so that you're in a lot of you got to work for it. So, 3-2. Stefano comes in with Caliban and Trinculo. Okay. Caliban tells them what Prospero usually does in the afternoon. Sleeps in his cave. He says, and I can take you to him and you can bring him. 
you can bash his brains out with a log. And then you'll be masters, and I'll serve you, etc. All right? Towards the end of that scene, 134, 135, <clears throat> Caliban has one of his most beautiful speeches, and it shows us the power that Miranda gave him when she taught him language, or at least when she taught him this language. This is uh, page 1592, right-hand column. They hear a sound, because Ariel is watching them, and Ariel plays a tune. And Caliban says, be not afeard. The aisle is full of noises, sounds, and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears, and sometimes voices that, if I then had waked after long sleep, would make me sleep again. And then, in dreaming, the clouds we thought would open and show riches ready to drop upon me, that when I waked, I cried to dream again. Notice he says, sometimes when he dreams, he has visions of what? Bounty getting ready to fall on him. And he wakes up and he goes, oh, Let me go back to sleep. Let me dream again. Why does he have these dreams? Is this Ariel intruding in his dreams? Or in his dreams, is Caliban perhaps seeing <coughs> something real? And I don't mean something real, something, you know, a big load of food about getting ready to drop on them. But the load of food is being symbolic of Caliban's fulfillment or his enrichment or his becoming complete. So that when he wakes up, he realizes he's still who and what he is. And he's like, oh, no, I could have had not stuff but I could have been changed into more than what I am, right? So, 3-3, three, three, we see Alonzo, Sebastian, Antonio, Gonzalo, Adrian, Francisco, etc. come in. And Sebastian and Antonio still have their plot in mind. And... They talk about what they've seen and such, and what they've heard. Let's see. And they see this table, and it's loaded with food. And they see lightning and hear thunder, and Ariel comes in, we're told, like a harpy, and claps his wings upon the table. And with a quaint device, the banquet vanishes. Now, what's a harpy? Body of a bird, face of a woman. These are the old furies from Greek literature, right? also called harpies. It's the thing from which we get the phrase to harp on. To harp on means to just nag, 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 nag. Because what do the harpies do? They chase down those who are guilty. Right? So Ariel says, you are three men of sin, line 53, whom destiny that hath no instrument this lower world and what is in it, the never surfeited sea, hath caused to belch up you. And on this island where man doth not inhabit, you amongst men being most unfit to live. I have made you mad. And even with such valor, men hang and drown their proper selves. So they draw their swords. Why? What are you going to do to me? A harpy's a goddess. Not a Mount Olympus goddess, kind of a Hades goddess. I and my fellows are ministers of fate. You can't, you can't touch us. The elements of whom your swords are tempered, that is, your swords are made of the elements, may as well wound the loud winds. Yeah, try and stab the wind. Or with be mocked at stabs, kill the still closing waters. 
My fellow ministers are alike invulnerable. If you can hurt, your swords are now too messy for your strengths. Too messy for your strengths, so they're holding their swords up, and as soon as Ariel says that, the hand goes down. It's like the sword is suddenly too heavy. But remember, so Ariel now draws to each of their minds. From Milan did supplant. That is, you three from Milan did supplant good Prospero, exposed unto the sea, which hath requit it him and his innocent child. You, Ariel's ascension slave, you threw him into the sea, and the sea did what? Spat them back out. Here, on this island. Why is Ariel dressed as a harpy? For chasing down your guilt for what you did to Prospero. The powers delaying, not forgetting, have incensed the seas and shores and all the creatures against your face. What are the powers? The gods. The gods never forget, Ariel is saying. The gods of what? They merely delayed their justice. Now, justice is going to be done. Thee of thy son, Alonzo, they have bereft. Your son is dead. Why? Because of what you did to Prospero. And do pronounce by me lingering perdition. Oh, take that back. He's not dead yet. He's slowly dying. And do pronounce by me lingering perdition worse than any death can be at once. Shall step by step attend you in your ways. Death is going to follow you. So, watch here in this most desolate isle, else falls upon your heads is nothing but heart sorrow and a clear life ensuing. Disappears. Prosper, well, good job. Bravely the figure of this harpy has thou performed my aerial and grace it had devouring. Of my instruction has thou nothing baited, etc., etc. He leaves Gonzalo. In the name of something holy, sir, why stand you in this strange stare? Notice, who saw Ariel as the harpy? Antonio, Sebastian, Alonso. Not Gonzalo. Gonzalo was not part, was not party to the dispatching Prospero and his daughter into the boat. He did do what? He gave him food, water, and books. He couldn't stop. He, would, he wasn't part of the plot. Okay? So he says, what gives? What are you looking at? Monsters, monsters. We thought the billows spoke and told me of it. The winds did sing it to me and the thunder. The deep and dreadful organ pipe pronounced the name of Prospero. It did bass my trespass. Therefore my son in the ooze is bed, and I'll seek him deeper than air plummet sounded. With him lie their, their live letter. It's kind of saying, I'm going to jump in the ocean because I'm going to die like these two. Okay. Gonzalo, all three of them are desperate. Means they will do desperate things. Their great guilt, like poison given to work a great time after, now begins to bite the spirits. Notice. Gonzalo knows the truth. He knows they're guilty. I do beseech you that are of suppler joints. Who are those that are of suppler joints? Younger men, Francisco and the others. Follow them. For what purpose? Hinder them from what this ecstasy may now provoke them to will. Keep them from harming themselves. For one, Prospero comes in with Ferdinand and Miranda. And he says, I apologize. For I have given you here a third of mine own life, of that for which I live, who once again I tender to thy hand. Why a third again of his own life? How is Miranda a third of his life? Why not half? 
third for himself, third for his dead wife, and then for his daughter. All thy vexations were but my trials of thy love. I was merely testing thee. And thou hast strangely, that means strongly, bravely, stood the test. Here, before heaven, I ratify this my rich gift. I ratify. I, I sign off. I agree to. O Ferdinand, do not smile at me that I boast her off, for thou shalt find she will outstrip all praise and make it halt behind her. In other words, you're going to have a hard time with her. He doesn't mean you're going to have a hard time with her because she's a handful. He means she is going to be worth more praise than you are even beginning to dream of. So he says, here, thine own acquisition worthily purchased, take my daughter. But if thou dost break her virgin not, if you have sex before all sanctimonious ceremonies, well, where are the sanctimonious ceremonies going to occur? There's no church on the island. You got to wait till you get back to Milan. Or Naples. Before all sanctimonious ceremonies may with full and holy right be administered, that is, and not just the justice of the peace, you got to get married in church by a priest, you know. No sweet dispersion shall the heavens let fall to make this contract grow. If you sleep with my daughter before you are actually wed in a church by a priest, Barren hate, sour-eyed disdain, and discord shall be shrew the union of your bed. Shakespeare's already written, Taming of the Shrew. With weed so lonely that you shall hate it both. Therefore, take heed, as Hyman's lance shall guide you, soon shall light you. That's a pretty nasty, you know, blessing, right? Curse. Keep in mind, he knows Prospero's what? A magician. A little added, you know, terror there. I, I better not touch her or dad's going to wreak hell on us. As I hope for quiet days, fair issue, long life. With such love as tis now. Okay. I hope for these all in the future. With such love as tis now. What's the such love as tis now? From when we both first spoke our love towards each other. How have their days been? Bliss. What's he want after he gets the ring on her finger and the ring on his finger? Bliss. I think Shakespeare is kind of saying something about the popular conception of wives after weddings. He wants quiet days. Quiet there means peaceful, blissful. Fair issue, beautiful children. What do the fairies promise to Theseus and Hippolyta, and the other two couples. Beautiful children. No birth defects. No um, changelings. Right? And long life. With such love as till now, the murkiest den, <laughs> the most opportune place. Why the murkiest den? Think King Lear. What did Gloucester say? about the conception of Edmund. It was got in a dark place. He and Edmund's mother, you almost get the impression, you know, they walk out of a pub, and, oh look, here's an alley. Let's do it here, right? The most opportune place, the strongest suggestion our worser genius can. Worser genius. That genius idea, 
It was a renaissance in, me in medieval commonplace that everyone had or has these spirits within that kind of guide and direct. You're supposed to have a single one that directs you to be what you are supposed to be. Whatever that thing is. is Michelangelo was obviously supposed to be what? Da Vinci was supposed to be what? Artist, mathematician, sculptor, engineer, designer, you know. Picasso was supposed to be a painter. Einstein was supposed to be a physicist, right? Imagine if Einstein had ended up, I don't know, an undertaker for his entire life. He wasn't. There was something within which said, Shakespeare. Shakespeare, according to some stories, began his early life not as a writer. He began life working, oh, what was it? Working for a tannery. And there's one story that suggests he might have accidentally killed his employer. Um, guy wrote a novel early this year, late last year, about Shakespeare, um, toys with that idea, and has him flee from, uh, actually his brother, flee from London to get away from it. Right? Anyways, it's this idea that we have these things. Notice he says, the worser genius, right? and we see this mentality even up to today. And we see it especially in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. In cartoons, Warner Brothers cartoons, whenever Bugs Bunny is tempted, what happens? Good angel on the right shoulder, guy with the pitchfork and horns on the left shoulder. Those are those internal geniuses. Okay, The worser genius can, the strongest suggestion that our worser genius, our worser spirit can suggest, shall never melt mine honor into lust. I'll maintain my honor to take away the edge of that day's celebration. He's saying, I won't dull the beauty, the joy, the desire of capping off the wedding day with the wedding night. When I shall think or Phoebus steeds are foundered or night kept chained below. Notice, Phoebus steeds are foundered. He's talking about when night comes and the bridegroom's away. And that's when Miranda, my wife and I, will go to the wedding chamber. And we're going to have a good time. Prospero. Fairly spell that. All right. I believe you. So far. Sit then and talk with her. She's yours. And he calls Ariel. And Ariel comes. And he says to Ariel, you know, you got one more job to do. Okay. Ariel tells, uh, he tells Ariel what it is. Iris comes in. Uh, Ceres comes in. We're going to skip quite a bit here. They see this, you know, Ferdinand sees the vision of Iris and Ceres and such. And Juno comes in also. So the gods are kind of serving them. And then Prospero says, uh, pick up with, well, 140 or so. He says as an aside, he says this to the audience. I forgot about Caliban. That foul conspiracy of the beast Caliban and his confederates against my life. That is, if I go back to myself, they're going to try and kill me. But just remember that. The minute of their plot has almost come. All right, spirits, no more. He says, Miranda, this is strange. Ferdinand says this. Your father's in some passion that works him strongly. Never till this day saw I him touched with anger so distempered. Distempered. Out of bounds. Out of control. So Prospero says, be cheerful. Our revels now are mended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits. They melted into the air, etc., etc. 
I am vexed, bear with my weakness, my old brain is troubled, be not disturbed with my infirmity. So, go back to my cell, there repose. He says, I'm going to take a walk. Why? To still my beating heart. It'll calm me down. All right? So, Prospero calls Ariel, says we have to deal with Caliban. Um, Ariel says they're drunk, red hot with drinking. Let's see. So Ariel leaves. Prospero is left alone. And he gets a, a sh very, very short soliloquy. And he's talking about Caliban. 188. A devil, a born devil, on whose nature nurture can never stick. We have the debate today, you know, about criminals and such. Is it nature or is it nurture? It's not a new debate. Shakespeare is wrestling with that debate in this play to some extent. All right? When Ferdinand says, I'm a prince, that's right, I'm a king. What's he saying? That's my nature. Therefore, he acts how? Nobly. If his nature is of a king, if he's born kingly, then he ought to act kingly. Well, how is Caliban born? Of a devil. Therefore, how ought he to act? Like a devil. Right? So, when Miranda taught a devil how to speak, what does he use language for? Cursing, he says. So, look at Prospero's words again. A devil, a born devil, on whose nature nurture can never stick. What's meant by nurture? How one is raised? What's included in that? Raising is all about educating. It's all about teaching a child. This, the duke, the A means out of, from, the duke is like Dukes, Barborm, the leader of war, or a duke, it's to lead. And the Asian just makes it into a noun form. Okay? So it's to be led out. What's the, the goal of education? Modern goal is not the same as the goal was in Shakespeare's day. Or as the goal was even 300 years ago. Or 1,000 or 2,000 years. According to Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, for example, in the university up into about 1700, the goal of education was to lead out of vice into virtue. The goal of education was to inculcate virtues in the individual. Why? to teach them to lead a good life. And the only way to learn the good life is to seek for what I had over here earlier, the sumum bonum, the highest good. Okay. That is all literally pet in this little speech by Prospero. Shakespeare's audience, the educated members would have understood that. So, whose nature, on whose nature, nurture can never stick. He can't, according to Prospero, learn. He won't learn. Why? Because of how he's born. On whom my pains, humanely taken, all, all, quite lost. <laughs> All, all lost. Quite, I've tried. I've tried to teach him. I've, it's almost like he says, I've tried to teach him his multiplication tables. 
He can't get over one by one. I've tried to teach him the Latin paradigms. I've tried to teach him X, Y, Z. He won't learn it. And as with age his body uglier grows, so his mind cankers. That kind of implies that Caliban, compared to how he is now, 12 years after Postal died, 12 years ago, Caliban wasn't as ugly as he is now. And what will he be like 12 years from now? He'll be even uglier. Why? As Plato suggests, I think it's in his Republic, ugly on the inside, that is, rotten foul on the inside, means rotten foul on the outside. And the rottener and fouler you are on the inside, the longer you live, the rottener and fouler you become. Right? So his mind cankers. The older Caliban grows, Prospero says, the fouler, the rottener, the eviler Caliban becomes. I will plague them all, read the tomb of glory. Caliban, Trinculo, and Stefano. Okay? So they come in. And Prospero plays various jokes on them and such. Okay? get to the end of uh, Act 4, and we're told 264. Prospero says, In response to aerials, hark they roar. That is, they're yelling because of things they're hearing and seeing. Prospero, let them be hunted soundly. That is, completely, totally, perfectly. At this hour lies at my mercy all mine enemies. That is, all my enemies are in my hands. I will do with them as I wish. Shortly shall all my labors end, and thou shalt have the air at freedom. Follow me a little longer. Do me a service. Okay? It's 5 1. Prospero comes in. He's got his magic robes. He's got his staff. And here's Ariel following him. It's a very majestic scene. Now does my project gather to a head. My charms crack not, my spirits obey, time goes upright with this carriage. How's the day? That is, what time is it? Notice, everything is proceeding. Everything is under my control. Ariel, it's the sixth hour, at which time, my lord, you said our work should cease. What's he mean? It's the sixth hour, at which time you said we would be released. Our job would be done. It's the sixth hour, by the way, that Christ is crucified. If that matters. Prospero, yeah, I did say that when first I raised the tempest. So how are the king and his followers? They're confined together, same fashion as you gave, just as you left them. They're prisoners in the line grove, which weather fends your cell. They cannot budge till your release. That is, they can't move until you release them. The king, his brother, and yours, they're all distracted. They're not in their right mind. The remainder, they mourn over them. But that good old man, Gonzalo, his tears run down his beard like winter's drops from eaves of reeds. Notice, why is Gonzalo full of tears? He's mourning for his king. That if you now beheld him, your affections would become tender. If you were to see them, even you would soften them. You think so? Mine would, if I were human. That is, I'm not an amphibian. I'm pure spirit. Pure spirits don't have tears. He says, if I were human, that would mean even you. Prospero, in mine shall. That is, and when I do see them, I will tear them. Hast thou, which art but e'er a touch, a feeling of their afflictions, and shall not myself, one of their kind, that relish all as sharply passion as they? That is, I relish the passions as sharply as they do. Shall I, shall thou, be kindlier moved than thou art? 
though with their high wrongs I am struck to the quick, to the quick, to the living inside me. They wronged me. He's saying, they deserve what? They deserve to die for what they did me and my daughter. Yet, with my nobler reason against my fury, do I take part. Nobler reason, nurture against my fury, my passion, my nature, takes part. It overrules that desire for revenge. The rarer action is in virtue than in vengeance. See, vengeance is entirely nature calling out. Virtue is what? Virtue is something you have to strive for. Virtue is not something inborn, inbred. It's something that has to be reached, grasped. It's this. You have to be led into virtue. Why Hamlet says what to his mother? Even if you're not virtuous, assume one for tonight. Don't go to your husband's bed. Why? Because then tomorrow night it will be hot. It will be freezing. Assume a virtue then again. And keep doing it. And he says, and pretty soon you'll no longer be assuming that virtue. You will be virtuous. Okay? So, Ariel says, I'll go bring them. Prospero traces a circle on the ground and says a long kind of spell. Um, calls out to all the things that he's used. And then he says, picking up with, let's say line 48. Graves at my command have waked their sleepers. He's resurrected the dead. Oped and led him forth by my so potent art. Have we seen in this play people rise from the dead? Not literally. Metaphorically, Ferdinand rises from the dead. Why? The king thinks he's dead. The king rises from the dead. Ferdinand thinks he's dead. Prospero's risen from the dead. Because the king, his brother, Prospero's brother, think Prospero's dead. Okay? This is the part of the speech, or this is the speech, that an awful lot of Shakespeare critics, even up into the, including the 20th century, say, this is Shakespeare through Prospero. Because we do see in other plays by Shakespeare, if we had read The Tempest, excuse me, The Winter's Tale, you would have seen a character who is thought to be long dead. grave open, so to speak. By my so potent art. But this rough magic I hear abjure. Why is his magic rough? Because it's learned. It's not natural. It does what? It violates all kinds of dead, stay dead. It breaks laws of physics. It's rough in that sense. It's a violation. But this rough magic I hear abjure. I swear off. I swear against. And when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do, that is, Ariel and the spirits to sing, to work mine end upon their senses, that this airy charm is for. He needs that heavenly music to do what? To soften their hearts. Then I'll break my staff, he says, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. I'll break the staff, and I'll, bow, I'll drown my book of spells. A lot of those critics have taken this to be Shakespeare. And the art is the art of writing. And the spells, the spells he's been creating since 
1588, Comedy of Errors, possibly, whenever he first wrote Comedy of Errors, which is usually taken to be his first play, until this one. And he's saying, I'm done. I don't have any more rough magic. I, I, I've written everything I can write. All right? So, they come in. And he says to Alonzo, a solemn air and the best comforter to an unsettled fancy, cure thy brains. So, the solemn air is he saying, let him hear this kind of music. Why? It will calm him down. Now useless boiled within thy skull, that is his brains, to Sebastian and Antonio. There stand, for you are spell stopped, holy Gonzalo, honorable man. Mine eyes, insociable to the show of thine, fall fellowly drops. And he starts to tear because of Gonzalo. And then he tells us, the audience, the charm dissolves apace. That is, Alonzo, Sebastian, Antonio, they're all starting to come around. And Gonzalo starts to take notice of Prospero. And as the morning steals upon the night, melting the darkness so their rising senses begin to chase the ignorant fumes that mantle their clear reason. And he says, oh, good Gonzalo. Notice, he addresses Gonzalo first. Why? Why doesn't he address his brother first? Gonzalo hasn't been under the charm. And Gonzalo was always faithful to him. He says, Oh, good Gonzalo, my true preserver. If it weren't for you, we'd be dead. And a loyal sir, to him thou followest. I will pay thy graces home, both in word and deed. Most cruel, now he addresses the king. Most cruelly dost thou, didst thou, Alonzo, use me and my daughter. Thy brother was a furtherer in the act. All right? Thou art pinched for now, Sebastian. And then he speaks to his own brother. Flesh and blood. There's your nature. You, brother mine, that entertained ambition. What's it mean, entertained? He doesn't say you were just ambitious. He says you allowed the idea of ambition to enter your heart slash mind and did what? Like his prayer to the heavens to rain grace upon his daughter and her future husband. You not only allowed it into your mind, you gave it a seat at the table and you fed it. You just kind of let ambition run wild in you. <coughs> That entertained ambition, expelled remorse, and nature, whom, with Sebastian, whose inward pinches therefore are most strong, would here have killed your king. I do forgive thee. I forgive you for what you've done. Unnatural though thou art, their understanding begins to swell. See, no, they've not spoken yet. He's speaking to them, and it's like they kind of look around, they hear the voice, they understand what it's, but they don't see him yet. And the approaching tide will shortly fill the reasonable shore that now lies foul and muddy. Notice the metaphor of the ocean and the tempest that's been going on the ocean that's also been going on in their minds. And now the ocean is subsiding, the water's pulling back, their reason is starting to clear. Not one of them that yet looks on me or would know me. He says, uh, Ariel, give me my hat and rapier. Why? Because they'll recognize that. They'll recognize me if I'm dressed as Prospero, Duke of Milan. So Ariel does. Okay. He puts on the clothing. Calls him presently. He says, you know, wake up the master, the bosun, and such. Gonzalo, all torment, trouble, wonder, and amazement inhabits here. Some heavenly power guide us out of this fearful country. Prospero, 
Behold, Sir King, the wronged Duke of Milan. And he points at himself. Here I am, Prospero. For more assurance that a living prince does now speak to thee, He doesn't just say, bow to me. He could if he had on his magician's clothes to go in just now. He says, to prove to you I'm not a spirit, he hugs him. And to thee and thy company, hearty welcome. And the king's like, uh, are you really him or not? I, I, I've been, I don't know. Thy pulse beats as a flesh and blood, and since I saw thee, the affliction of my mind amends. With which I fear madness held me. This must be. There's a strange story. How are you alive? Then he turns to Gonzalo. First, noble friend, let me embrace thine age, whose honor cannot be measured or confined. Whether this be or not, I'll not uh, I'm not going to swear this is really happening. Prospero, you, you, you're still tasting some of the subtleties of this island. They won't let you believe things certain. Why? Well, if it's a thing certain, do you need to believe it? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Paul writes in the book of Hebrews. Welcome, my friends, all. Okay, Alonzo, who helped my brother depose me, Antonio, who deposed me, Sebastian, who tried to take his brother's place as king, I count you all my friends. But he says to Sebastian and Antonio, but you, my brace of friends, were I so minded, I here could pluck his highness frown upon you and justify you traitors. If I would have been, I could tell Alonzo, you guys were not so minded. I won't tell any tales now. Why? I'll just keep that hanging over your head. Behave better. Sebastian, the devil speaks now. Prosper. No! In other words, damn you! I'm trying to teach you something here. Learn! You, most wicked sir, whom to call brother, to his brother, would even affect my mouth. I do forgive the rankest fault. To even call you brother, you make me want to vomit. But I forgive. Why is it the rankest fault? What did Antonio actually intend by usurping his place? It's the rankest. It's the foulest fault. What's the first fault, the first sin? When Cain kills his brother Abel. Prospero is essentially saying, you tried to be a king. You put me in a boat, and you didn't put food and water in it. You put me and my daughter in the ocean. What's going to happen to somebody without food and water in a boat on the ocean? They're going to die. At least Gonzalo gave us food and water. Right? All of them. That is, I forgive all of them, all of your faults, and require my dukedom of thee. Give it back. Uh, if you are Prospero, tell us how you're still alive, and I'll tell you later a little while. Okay. So, my daughter's still alive. Prospero says, In this last tempest, I perceive these lords at this encounter do so much admire that they devour their reason and scarce think their office. They still don't believe what they're seeing. And so he discovers to them Ferdinand and Miranda playing chess. How does he discover them? Does he Pull a curtain back? Does he go, see? <laughs> and there's Ferdinand and Miranda. And how's Ferdinand dressed? Nicely. And what's the king think? He was dead. Now he's alive. Huh. Sweet Lord, you play me false. No, my dearest love. You cheated. That's what you play me false means. I, I would not. Uh, for a score of kingdoms. And she turns and looks. And what does she see? Here's, Fer here's Ferdinand right here. She's right here. And she turns around and she sees Alonzo, 
Sebastian, Antonio, Gonzalo, later on, Trinculo, Stefano, Francisco, a whole bunch of other O's, right? And what does she say? Oh, wonder. How many goodly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Prospero, tis new to me. What's she mean? You're right. There's more than just Ferdinand. But is this maid with whom? Then Ferdinand says, she's not a goddess, she's mortal, she's my wife. Alonzo, I am hers. She says, this makes you father to her. And he says, and I am her father. But how will it sound that I must ask my child forgiveness? And Prospero, just stop. Just stop right there. Let us not burden our remembrances with a heaviness that's gone. What's Prospero telling him? What do Pumba and Timon teach Simba in The Lion King? What do you have to do to your past? Put it behind you. He says, don't remember it? No. It's gone. It's gone. How so? Prospero has forgiven them. He has reconciled them to himself. Have they reconciled themselves to him yet? Antonio, not clear, but he has bridged the divide between them. Okay? So, um, The bosun comes in. We find all the sailors are fine. Pros uh, Caliban comes in. Trinculo and Stefano. A couple minutes left. And Prospero says, these are your men, my lord. But this misshapen knave, line 271, his mother was a witch and once so strong that could control the moon, make flows and ebbs, and deal in her command without her power. These three have robbed me. This demi-devil, he's a bastard one, had plotted with them to take my life. These two, you've got to take and acknowledge yours. This thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. Now, a lot of critics, especially more modern current critics, take this thing of darkness to be referring to Caliban's color. Right? And Prosper says, this one's mine. Caliban, <laughs> I shall be pinched to death. He's going to kill me. So, Alonzo looks at Caliban and says, Strange thing is there I looked on. Prospero, he is as disproportioned in his manners as in his shape. Go, Sirrah, to my cell. He doesn't say go thing. Take with you your companions as you look to have my pardon. Trim it handsomely. If you want to be forgiven, prepare my cell. Trim it, deck it out. Caliban, I, that I will. What's the I will refer to? I will trim out your cell. Why? Because I will, I desire your pardon. And I'll be wise hereafter. Notice, not end of sentence. And seek for grace. Nurture. Nurture. I'll try to change. Seek for grace. Acquire virtue. What a thrice double ass was I to take this drunkard for a god and worship this dull fool. Go to. Away. So Prospero gives us his epilogue. Now my charms are all overthrown. And what strength I have is mine own, which is most faint. Again, if you do read this, as this is Shakespeare speaking, he only has four years to live. Now tis true, I must be here confined by you, or sent to Naples. Let me not, since I have my dukedom got, pardon the deceiver, dwell in this bare island by your spell, but release me from my bands with the help of your good hands. Come on, guys, give me an applause here. Send me off appropriately. 
gentle breath of yours my sails must fill or else my project fails. What was his project? To please. If you enjoyed this play. Now I want, that is I lack, spirits to enforce, art to enchant. I've, I don't have the gift anymore. And my ending is despair. Unless I be relieved by prayer, which pieces, pierces so that it assaults mercy itself. Prayer pierces mercy and frees all faults, as you from crimes would pardon me. If you want to be forgiven, then what? Let your indulgence, he's talking about the Catholic practice of selling indulgences, let your indulgence indulge me, set me free. If you want to be forgiven, forgive me with a pause. All right, that's it, obviously, since we're out of time. Papers due Monday by noon. If you want to put them in the box on my door or in my mail slot in the um, mail room, if you don't want it back, you can email it to me. If you want it back, I need hard copies. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed it. Or at least endured it.